What's going on, everyone? Welcome to another episode of, I never know what to call these episodes or segments, or we'll call it an episode, another episode of Cooking and Conversation. I'm super excited for this one because I have a good friend of mine here with us, uh, Brendan King, and I cooked at the Duquesne Club together over, what was that, about 10 years ago? Or yeah, yeah about 10 years ago. Man, time flies. And so Brendan and I cooked together for a few years at the Duquesne Club. He's a uh, great chef. He's now in the Philly area. But um, Brendan, you were at the club for a long time. How long did you work at the club? Uh, I was there for 10 years, actually. Um, so I got hired right out of culinary school, um, right out of bachelor's. And I um, I remember sitting in, in the inter interview with chef and um, I said, I want to be here a year and a half, two years, and then move on and learn from someone else, you know, and I, and I really meant it at the time. And, you know, I was still on Garmage, like a, a year and a few months after uh, getting there. And what I came to find is every time that I thought I was like nailing down a station and like starting to get quote bored as bored as one can be at that place, to be honest, which is really not all that bored, but you know, when it starts getting easier um, and more manageable, um, then somebody else would leave and I would move into a new station. So there was, I mean, 10 years and it was nonstop learning the entire time. Um, you know, every time something else happened, I moved up a, a spot. So started in Garmage and, uh, left as a sous chef, which was, um, quite the experience, uh, humbling experience, challenging, um, formative of course. So. Yeah, because I was there for about five and a half years, and yeah, it's like it's one of those places where I know, I know you are one of the, much like me. The whole time I was there, and you correct me if I'm wrong, because you were there a little longer than I was. But the whole time I was there, I didn't really know of people other than you and I that stayed on the PM shift the whole time. Most people moved to gradually moved to AM. Um, uh, there was a few that would seemed to have stuck around there was there was a few that also left and came back well um, yeah that happened a lot a lot uh i used to call it hotel california you can check out any time you like but you can mm -hmm. never leave i mean and still i still don't feel like i've left to be honest like i still three years now in philly i'm still searching for a place to f that feels like home um i was starting to feel that pre-covid um you know finally but you know I was back at the club in November for an event and it still felt like home. I forgot where some things were, but like the people were the same. Um, you know, the faces that you wanted to see were still there. Um, you know, the, the expectation of excellence was still there. Like it was all, it was just, it was the same. Um, and it was a great feeling to be back in that kitchen. Um, yeah, it was definitely a good place to be, especially, you know, in that business because with turnovers, I remember, it was probably the second week I was there. This is before you worked there. I remember I was in the salad pantry and there was someone, I can't even remember their name, but they came, they started that day and they came and they worked, you know how you would start, you would start typically at either noon or one o'clock mm -hmm. and then three o'clock we would go on break and we'd have an hour break for lunch. So we all, we worked the morning, then we went to or the earlier part of the day. Then we went on break and we came back. That person just never came back. And that like being there for like two weeks and still trying to get my bearings. When I saw that, I was like, what is happening here? <laughs> but that sticks with me. I got to oh, say, I saw you. that on more than one occasion also. Uh -huh. um, you either have it or you don't, you know, I think, um, you know, and, and correct me if you see it differently. I, I guess maybe because of where we were, it might've been somewhat different, but in this, in this, um, I don't know, environment of equality, like racial equality, um, you know, it's June, so Pride Month also. Like, for me, the, the kitchen is the great equalizer, at least in my eyes, you know what I mean? Either you can or you can't, and it never had anything to do with um, color of your skin or, um, you know, your, your sexuality or your gender. It's, does the food get on the plate and does it get done correctly? Um, you know, some of my favorite people there weren't of the, you know, they weren't white, straight white males. You know what I mean? Like even, even age, 
I mean, yeah, age is sure. a big thing because, you know, you and I both, before we left, we were sous chefs there. But when you took on that role, the biggest thing that was in my mind when I got promoted to that role was these guys who work AM, who I greatly, greatly respect, and the gals who work AM, who I greatly respect, they've been there for a long They Some of them worked there longer than I was alive at that point. And for so sure. I had to come in and be able to lead them and get their respect. And that was one of the questions that got asked to me in my interview when I was interviewing from line cook to management was, you know, how do you think you'll handle leading people who are twice your age? And so, yeah, so that was a big part of it, too. I, I, I remember having the exact same thought process um, coming out, again, coming out of uh, culinary school, thinking I'm uh, hot shit, whatever, you know, and then you, you, you try to keep names out of this, right? Yeah, as much as possible. Yeah, don't don't call anyone out unless you want to call them out and you want to have words after. <laughs> the, the the morning garmage guy. Like I remember, I remember um, thinking if I want him to respect me, um, like if I want to be a sous chef here one day, I need to not just earn that title. I need to prove that I should be followed, and not just because somebody gave me a title, um, but because I earned it. Because I. Um, you know, had had the tools um, required for for that um, for that title. So yeah, I, I remember having the exact same thought process uh, mm -hmm. pretty early on. Yeah, well, it, it's you know, it's something you had to step into. You had to learn it, and I think Chef Koganauer, who you know was both of our mentors, he really did train you to step into that because you talk about leadership epitomized. He is sure. like, he's the best leader that I've ever worked with that I've ever been around and super professional, um, just very, extremely talented skill set, better than anyone that I've ever worked with. And, you know, he just, he knew exactly when to get stern and when to give a little, and it, it yeah. takes something. Now I didn't work with him when he first took over there. So I don't know if that's something that he stepped into and learned as he went, or if that's something that he just innately had, but that would be something interesting. I might have to have a conversation with him. Uh, maybe I'll invite him to be on a cooking and conversation and we can have a conversation about that at some point. That'd be great. Yeah. I, <laughs> there's, there's a large segment of chefs in Pittsburgh now um, that all you have to do is say chef you don't have to say last names. You don't have to bring anybody, you know, you just say, yeah, I was talking to chef and, and they know it's just Kogan Howard. It's like, you know what I mean? Like you well, don't have to bring that the, in. That's just, yeah. The, the, He's the, the number only guy of, I call chef. Yeah. Even today. I mean, it's been 10 years since I've worked there and I still will refer to, if I go back and visit, have dinner there, I still refer to him as chef. And he's sure. the only one that I give that title to. I mean, I worked with a lot of great people who I can say are chefs, but when I address them, I address them by their first name. Yeah, chef absolutely. Chef. <laughs> that's just and, the, and that's the level of respect earned completely. Um, and yeah. because of that, um, because of his way of leadership, his his leadership, like you mentioned, that was uh, yeah. yeah, definitely. Um, there's the, way more people in the city that owe their careers to him, um, then I think many people would probably even recognize or understand, to be honest. Yep, for um, sure. So let's take a minute here. What are we cooking today? Yeah, so um, I thought it'd be fun to make some burgers, uh, aside from the I fact that burgers. it's... The, dude, come on. It's <laughs> the best, right? I mean, it's, I love it's everything. It's the summer. I burgers, especially. I, I, I wish I could say that I was outside on my back grill, uh, I think you told me earlier that one of your first guests was cooking tuna um, yep. on a grill Chef outside. Chris yeah, yep. so I wish I had a I wish I had a grill for this, but um, I think the burger is the the epitome of sort of humble food. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it also transcends. Um, everybody loves burgers. Um, everybody, and, and they're also different, and that's why I kind of like them. Um, and even even I make them different every time, um, or, or or often they're they're different. Um, you know, one thick patty, one smash burger. We were talking earlier about um, you know the the smash burger idea, or even um, you know In and Out and some of those thinner patties and and how how that works. So 
Um, I think it's also a great way of talking about um, the state of restaurants today. Uh, yeah. How we how we left off pre COVID. I mean, everybody has that date in their head right now. March uh, March twentieth. You know, um, well. March 15th was the date it was handed down from the governor. Uh, my last day as an employed chef was the 20th. Um, days that I didn't expect to like stand out in my mind as anything other than just a normal day. Um, but I think burgers are great. They epitomize, they epitomize the difference between something like a McDonald's burger that people expect to be cheap they prove that people think that food should be cheap because of places like McDonald's um, that are able to do a burger for a dollar uh, or whatever it is today. I don't know. I don't, I don't eat there. Um, and, and why some people would turn their nose up at the thought of a, you know, a $20 burger or more. Um, you know, I, I don't think people realize the true cost of running a restaurant and that um, that goes beyond just, you know, the price of the food, um, and how many other hidden, hidden costs there are. Um, so I think coming out of, out of, uh, COVID on the other end, you know, it, you know, I don't know if there is an end, I guess that's probably a wrong way of phrasing it, but, um, we as the general public eating should be a little bit more understanding of the true cost. Um, I don't know exactly the numbers of, how many people are currently unemployed that are restaurant workers and how many restaurants are going to close down because they can't make it through because the margins are so small. Um, but I, you know, being willing and able to pay for the price of the goods as they should be charged is something I think we should pay a lot more attention to. I agree. It's a huge problem, not only for the restaurants, but also for the food purveyors. Because there are food purveyors that didn't get paid from the last shipment that they made to certain restaurants. Right. And then they're not going to get paid, period. And now restaurants are going under. The larger purveyors are going to scoop them up. So those of us who love the local farm-to-table type deal, that may take a while to come back. And that's a scary thing. And not only that, but you know, all the restaurants. I mean, I love the experience of going to a restaurant. Now, I have the good fortune, and you do, Brandon. We can we have – I call it a blessing and a curse – we have the blessing of whenever we want to eat something, we can just go make it. We have All the right. curse of whenever we want to make something, we can just go make it. So it's a blessing and a curse. So we don't necessarily have to go to restaurants to get certain foods, but I love the experience going there, yeah. relaxing, sitting down with people. I'm going to bring up your other camera so we can see what you're doing there. Oh, yeah, that's fun techie stuff, <laughs> uh, bringing up cameras I, it usually takes me a lot more time to get the second camera view on there with my uh my youtube channel but yeah uh at doing all the editing and getting that in after the fact yeah Tell I, people about your youtube channel too really quickly while you're cutting cool yeah so um what i didn't want to do with my unemployment was ooh, that's not a good looking sweet potato i thought i'd make some sweet potato fries too to go with uh uh, with the burgers. The uh, only what problem I, didn't... I have with that is the fact that I'm not there to eat them with you. Yeah, my bad, man. <laughs> we'll have to get together the next time I'm back home in Pittsburgh for sure, for sure and do something. Um, so I, I was absolutely hell-bent on not wasting my time uh, unemployed. Um, I wanted to learn a new skill. Um, and I love watching YouTube. I know that, like, I... I I love finding what other people are doing in the world um, and how they're doing things. And, you know, I love the Korean street food videos as much as I love watching, you know, the tech YouTubers that talk about the newest, latest, um, you know, computers that are coming out or, you know, it's gotten into a big rabbit hole of um, cameras and, editing and photography and all these other things skills that I didn't have before or didn't necessarily know that I wanted um, but I thought would be fun to learn uh, so my my channel is called I run chef um, 
sort of a play on Iron Chef, but it's I Run. I like it. Uh, yeah, so I, I do triathlon and endurance and um, marathons in my free time also. Um, so that was where that name came from. Um, I also, a while ago, did a health coaching uh, course. I had at one point thought about getting more into health coaching and a little more out of kitchens. Um, and, and I thought that I'd maybe want to work with other triathletes or athletes. Uh, so I run chef became the uh, title of my channel. I was going to ask you about that. How has your background now with the health certification, how's that impacted the way you cook? Um, I'm a lot more conscientious, of course. Um, you know, look, I don't eat burgers all the time, but I almost never have flour in my apartment. Um, I made buns the other day because uh, I thought it'd be fun to do something else. That video just went up on my channel yesterday. Um, you know, I, I try to be a lot more conscientious of what I eat and when I eat and how I eat. So the fact that I have uh, sweet potatoes and bread in my apartment at the same time is quite the departure for me. Um, I have that, I have that influence on people. <laughs> what? Very carb heavy. Yeah, carb heavy, for sure. I, I thought about making uh, spaghetti squash today, but it's not the right there's season. Al for there's that. always room for spaghetti squash. I want to say that uh, real quick. Deb hopped on the line. Deb watches a lot of these with us. She's on almost every show that that I do. I'm very appreciative for that. And she says that she appreciates restaurant workers and that she likes to take care of them. There, she's enjoying our chat. She's there in. Uh, she's on vacation in Gatlingburg, Tennessee. Oh, wow. So, I have yeah. no idea where Gatlinburg is. Well, I do know that I saw Deb earlier post a picture of the vehicle that they're driving around in, and there were bear prints in the back, and she showed some pictures of bears. So she's in the wilderness somewhere. Oh. But <laughs> I so, remember I remember one year at the club, Brandon. I don't know if you were there or not. We did a wild game dinner, and we actually had bear as part of the menu. Do you remember that? I think I do. The one – the. The one thing that I remember most about the uh, game dinner, um, I think it was, I, I have my reasons for remembering the year, but it was uh, either late 2010, early 2011. Um, when was that? Was that a February thing or a November thing? I don't remember off the top of my head. I know what we've done because we did a game dinner. We also did a cigar dinner, I remember. Yeah, and there we were was so many of those. Like, yeah. Yeah. I remember we did um, a corned antelope part. Mm. Do you remember that antelope part? Or I mean, we may have pastrami it, um, but I remember the corning process of it, and that stood out in my mind. Um, I'm at my high school. I went to Avonworth, uh, small high school, kind of in the middle, stuck between North Allegheny and North uh, North Hills, two really large schools. This tiny little school in our uh, our mascot was the antelope, oddly enough. Um, so I remember, like, I actually have a picture of me holding the antelope part, and I thought it was funny. So um, <laughs> I'm going to – I want to say thank you to Deb real quick. She said she's going to sign off. She's in the Smoky Mountains. Okay. And uh, So, Deb, thanks so much. Enjoy your vacation. We're going to keep cooking here. You can come back thanks, a little later. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run, um, oddly enough. My, so I don't know if you've ever lived in a city uh, apartment. But the mm -hmm. kitchens are absolutely oh. tiny, um, and there aren't very many plugs. And I just got an air fryer, and it's kind of loud anyways. So I have my air fryer in my bedroom. Um, <laughs> I'm glad my wife's not home to yell at me for that <laughs> just yet. Uh, so I'm going to throw these sweet potato fries in the air fryer real they quick. I know we don't have the camera on it, but I think I can be able to talk uh, through it while I'm doing it. That reminds me of, uh, do you watch, have you ever watched The Office, Brendan? Yeah. Remember when <laughs> Michael Scott has his George Foreman grill in his bedroom because he likes to wake up to the smell of bacon, but can't afford a butler. And that when, that's one of my favorite episodes where he grilled his foot because he stepped on his yes. George Foreman grill that he keeps in his bedroom. So Brendan has the same thing. He just keeps his air fryer in his bedroom so he can make sweet potato fries, wake up to the smell of sweet potato fries in the morning. Yeah, absolutely. I think that makes sense. Or, um, spaghetti, or spaghetti squash. I don't know what you're cooking in there, but. 
Um, actually, we just got it for um, as a wedding present, um, and we haven't done too much in it uh, just yet. But what I'm doing with it is taking the idea of a normal French fry, where yeah. you would blanch it in the fryer at a lower temperature, um, and then crank it up and do the second fry. Um, I've done that before in there. I think it turns out really good. Um, it's, uh, it's on right now for 10 minutes at 300 and then we're going to go back and, uh, crank it up to like 400 for another 10, uh, just to finish it up. I'm also going to turn my oven on. I made those buns for these burgers uh, a couple days ago, two days ago, just so I'd have time to uh, edit the video, put it up on my page. Um, on my YouTube page before this. Um, so I just wet a little paper towel. I'm gonna wrap them in foil once my oven gets hot. I hope that uh, a little bit of the moisture from the paper towel helps kind of like re-steam them and freshen them up and bring them back to life. We can link um, out to that video uh, that you posted on your YouTube channel in the comments here and in the show notes of the podcast episode. Yeah, that'd be really cool. When this goes live. So if you wanna watch the bun process, you can go back and watch that on Brandon's YouTube channel. I got to admit, I was really proud of myself. I'm not a baker. I never have been. Um, That's so funny. I'm the same way. You know, it, it, and it, it, it's such a simple recipe. Like the fact that I can do it makes me feel like anyone can do it. Um, so, you know, I, I think something like, uh, you know, sourdoughs are a lot more finicky. But, but this this dough is a lot more white bready, um, just the yeast risen, simple uh, simple dough. Uh, it starts with, um, in a pot, water, milk, and uh, bread flour. And what you do is you kind of cook it like a roux, even though there's water in it, it's still like, I guess it's, there's, they call it a tang zong, I believe is the pronunciation. Um, but you start with that, and then you add more milk to it um, to cool it down. One egg, your flour, uh, sugar, your yeast, a uh, little bit of salt, and uh, I think that's it. Um, and then... You proof it, and then you shape it, and then you proof it again, and then uh, then it's done. Uh, you bake it half hour, like super quick. So you have both of these cameras on, right? They're both on. We're watching you put you put the ground meat it looked like into a Ziploc, and now you're smashing it, smashing it down. Yeah. So this is how I like to get my style of smash burger is by using the bag and just cutting squares kind of like wendy's uh are we allowed to use yeah brand names like that on this this channel? Might, we can do whatever we want this is our show nice <laughs> um don't be afraid you know, I, Again, we I were talking talk about, about yeah, talk about favorite burgers. I want to get your burger list because I have a very serious burger list, and my girlfriend knows that when we go places and there's a burger joint, I have to eat there regardless mm -hmm. because I have to try it so that I can put it in its appropriate slot on my burger list if it even makes the burger list. So I want to hear your burger assessment of the different places that you've been. All right, so I think my favorite burger here in Philadelphia is a place called Royal Boucherie. Um, I don't know if you've heard about that one, but um, the, the chef is Nick Elmy. Um, he got famous. Uh, well, I mean, he's a great chef, but he was on Top Chef, uh, I believe, season 11 he won. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, it was his second restaurant. Um, the first one is called Laurel, uh, which is like high-end, fine dining, kind of the stuff that we used to make uh, or do at, at the club. Um, and then he opened Royal Boucherie, which is a, um, like a charcuterie spot. So they do a lot of charcuterie in house. Everything is, is made there and it's kind of a fun, like pubby sort of feeling, um, with great food. So they have a really good burger there. That's my favorite. Um, like I hate to use the word fancy burger, but like 
It's my favorite fancy burger. Um, as far as like burgers that everyone would be aware of, um, I like Five Guys a lot. Double cheeseburger all the way. With bacon. Uh, with bacon. Of course. Um, don't go bacon, my heart. <laughs> That's right. I have a big affinity to bacon. I like. I love bacon. My, I don't know if you can see it on this camera, but this like floor mat in front of my sink is a pig. And then I have this kitchen towel too. That's praise the lard. Yeah. Uh, so pigs are one of my favorites. Pork belly. You can't go wrong. Dude, never. Um, so this is how I like to shape my burgers. Um, that, that smash burger idea. Um, I think, so we recently redesigned or reconfigured whatever word you want to use our burger at the hotel that I'm, that I was working at pre pre uh, coronavirus. And after doing a lot of research, just, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? Testing. Not, not, not necessarily testing, but um, just asking people. There's a, fancier word that I was looking for. Surveying. And yeah, surveying is a good word too, I guess. Not the word I was looking for, but it'll work. You got a um, consensus, you put it that way. Yeah. A lot of people like the smash burger idea. And I do too. Um what I like about it is because it's a quick cook thing, um it stays juicier, right? Um whereas I think when you cook a, a thick like eight ounce burger, uh you end up like any other thing that's thick and cooked, um, the outside is a lot drier than the inside. Like it takes so much longer to get to that, um, that temperature that you're looking for. Um, yeah, so I agree that's one of the reasons why I like the smash burger style. I think now to give you, you know, I think my favorite burger joint, and since, since you went local first, my favorite local burger joint in Pittsburgh is probably Tassaro's. Have you ever okay. been to Tassaro's? No, I haven't. It's a just a real little joint. It's a bar, and you go in and sit down, and their menu has a few different things on it, but you go there for the burgers. And the cool thing is you can't get fries with your burgers because they don't have a deep fryer. Oh, so shit. you get home fries, but they put onions and bacon, and, and they, they, they cook it in a cast iron pan that's really well seasoned. The burgers are fantastic. They have a certain mix of beef, and they cook it in a certain way. I believe they have a wood-fired grill, um, if, nice. if I'm remembering correctly. But their burgers, I've been there like three or four times, and I make it a point anytime. I believe it's in like the Bloomfield area. Okay. Anytime I'm around there, I have to go in and grab a burger. But um, So that's local. But my list of like burgers are like chain-type places, and I have to keep a rolling list. Um, number one for me, is Shake Shack. I think mm -hmm. Shake Shack's burgers, they're awesome. I like, I really, really like, and their fries. They have crinkle cut fries that are really crispy, really, really good. Um, number two is In N Out. I really like In N Out sure. when I get to try it. They're pretty perfect. Just the standard regular burger, it's pretty spot on and delicious. Number three, I think the Five Guys. I just, I, there is, you can't go wrong with a Five Guys. It's super delicious. I think number four has to be Smash Burger. Mm -hmm. because uh, smash burger is very comparable to five guys, but five guys for me is like the OG. Cause I had them first. Right. So I think number four would probably be smash burger. And if I'm going to round it out with a five, you know, when I think about all the different places that I've had, I'd probably give number five to Wendy's. You know what? I, I probably throw that in there as well. Um, yeah. As far as the fast food burgers uh, of that sort of caliber, like I, I hesitate to even call Five Guys or In and Out a fast food burger. They they don't qualify for me as fast food. But to be fair, it is a chain. So I agree yeah, with you. But it is a chain. So I'm thinking like you know where could it, where it has uh, the the when I say like the Tassars and the local places, I'm thinking of places that don't have more than one location. Right. Where right. it's like that's quote unquote specialty. Now what are you mixing up right there in that bowl? All right. So when we started to go over and changing our burger at the hotel. One of the reasons we changed it was it was surprisingly one of our top three sellers. And I say surprising 
not that it was one of our top three sellers, but because we decided to change it. Um, and we were convinced that it was because it wasn't necessarily the best burger it could be, uh, but because it's, again, something relatable, which is why we're making them again, or why we're making them today. Um, so we decided that we liked the double patty idea. Um, we settled on a two cheese blend. So we had American and a, a smoked cheddar, one on each patty. Um, and of course you need like the sauce, right? Everybody's got to have like their sauce. So I set out to create a burger sauce that was everything that the McDonald's sauce wasn't, right? You know, I wanted to be like, I wanted it to just like enhance the flavor of the meat. I wanted it to be umami and meaty, but I didn't necessarily, but I didn't want it to be like the McDonald's sauce. So what I ended up coming up with, um, and this is just sort of my home version of it, was um, a mixture of QP mayo, which is like a Japanese mayo that has MSG in it. Um, so it, again, adds that like meatiness. Um, I use sun-dried tomatoes because I wanted to stay away from the ketchup. I don't have any sun-dried tomatoes here at home, um, but I use ketchup instead. Um, there's a guy, Ivan Ramen, uh, out of New York that got famous for his uh, ramen bowls in Japan because he was putting tomatoes, uh, oven-roasted tomatoes, ORTs, if you will, in, in, the, um, in the bowl because of, again, the umami flavor that it brings to the, to the table. It's so funny you brought up ORTs because as you were using your air fryer, the thought in my mind was, I bet you could make ORTs in that. I bet you really could. Speaking of air fryer, the timer just went off. Yeah, go check it out. But um, uh, So I also added a splash of um, sriracha. So it sriracha. Got it. Yeah, so the entire idea of this was how can I make something that will just make it taste meatier? but not be the, the McDonald's uh, sauce. We do serve the burger with pickles, so like you still get that flavor in it. And, um, oh, if I didn't say it too, I have miso in here, just a little bit of miso, um, again, for that umami, umami deal going on. I'm gonna pull these buns out because I don't need to bake them anymore. I just want them for a little warmth He's and a little freshness. He's pulling the bread out of the oven. For those of you listening, when he says pull these buns out, you rest assured. He's pulling the bread out of the oven. And you can watch they the video and see it. Out of the oven. <laughs> oh, and one's nice. missing because I had to eat it just to of make course. sure it was good. Um, so I'm surprised you didn't go to the honey cup mustard. No. I actually wasn't even thinking about, about that. Um, that. I had no thought of good. putting mustard in it at all. You have to admit the honey cup mustard and mayo mix is a tasty little sauce. Yes, it was. Especially on salmon pastrami. Dude, classic, right? <laughs> a little pickled fennel. Yep. Yep. I actually took that to um, a restaurant that I was doing, so a barbecue joint that I was doing some consulting for a few years back as one of the, uh, uh, of course, dip for chicken tenders but also one of the three French fry dips that they would provide was mm -hmm. hun the honey cup and mayo. I'm like, if you just can't beat it, it's just really solid. Yeah. Easy. And you got a little bit of sweet and then you got that mm -hmm. peppery, like, I don't know, or pecan mustard flavor also. Mm -hmm. I do uh, like some mustard though. I will say that mustard is when it's good mustard. Yellow mustard yeah. I can do like on a hot dog in the summer, but it doesn't really do it for me. I like, you know, the mustard I really like, believe it or not, is stadium mustard. Yeah. And there's an actual, you know, it's nice and dark. It's yeah. The only bad part of the stadium mustard is that it's from Cleveland. Oh, nothing good comes from Cleveland. <laughs> you know, and I'm, I'm going to ruffle a few feathers of my friends here in Philadelphia, and I've said it before, so it's not like I'm, like, not saying anything that they wouldn't uh, have already been heard from me before. But turns out all the teams I hate the most in – across professional sports are orange, right? The Browns, the uh, Bengals, Bengals, and of course the Flyers. Flyers, yep. So, um, hey, yep. You, you can't, know, I mean, when you're a Steeler, Penguin, Pirate fan, I mean, even though the Pirates are pretty terrible most of the time, they're still, 
you love to they, you love to to see them win when they were good in those three years thirteen what is it two thirteen fourteen fifteen yeah I it mean was fun. yeah it was a really fun time and you didn't hear a lot of people disliking them like you hear other other teams after they've been good for a while but so what are you gonna season your burgers with here is this just salt and pepper real s- simple salt and pepper I'm gonna try yeah. and only season half of them right now uh, with salt and when my wife gets home. After work, I'll just make yep. her dinner uh, separately. Um, I carefully flip these over. One of the things I noticed too, um, and it's not like I'm coming to you with any groundbreaking information. Um, when you overwork the meat, you end up with a tougher burger, even though it's ground. So I tried to do as little like, you know, at the at the hotel we would like, you know, smack it together and form it into a ball and then we were pushing it into a, a, a mold um, actually between two deli lids that was our, our mold um, sorry like deli container plastic cork containers yeah, yeah I, got that. I know what, you're talking I know about. what you mean I know you would get that I, but I guess we used to for... drink out of those those are like the best glasses drinking glasses in the world they're also the best bowls and plates and literally <laughs> yeah, anything they do if you're a chef and you haven't eaten a meal out of a deli cup, then I don't know if you're actually a chef. Yep, agreed. Um, so I, I also like I like flatter patties the way that you did that as well because I like that they cook fast, like you said. Mm-hmm. And I also I like there's something sexy, and I'll use that word, and I only really use that with burgers, but I like there's something sexy about like a really good medium rare burger. Mm-hmm. I mean, so, just searing it on both sides, and oh, it's so good. I also use the word sexy more with food than anything else. <laughs> I, I, I think that, I know, right? I think that if you don't see food as, as sexy, then you're, and you're in this profession, you're probably in the wrong profession. The other thing um, I want to mention is you have a really nice cast iron pan there. And I have one as well, and that's my favorite pan. I love using cast iron for pretty much everything that I can possibly use it for. Talk to us yeah. a little bit about that. Um, so cast irons are great because they are nonstick. Um, they also retain a little bit of um, flavor from whatever the last thing it was that you cooked. Uh, but because it's such a thick metal, it's really even in cooking. Um, the temperature across the board is, is much more, um, uniform. And, uh, I don't know why. And and I think every chef will tell you this, these like little intricacies about their kitchen, but my stove kind of tilts a little bit. So when I try and sear like this, um, I guess I'm looking at it, my top right corner is always the hottest. So if I'm trying to Mm -hmm. sear here and like here, it just, you know, it's never like a great sear unless, unless I uh, position the pan differently on the burner. Do you remember the, do you remember the old stoves we had at the club before they did the kitchen remodel? Do you remember those? Like that's what always, that taught me about plan pan placement and controlling heat because those eyes, the, the, the old stoves we had to cook on were a flat cast iron top and they had an eye with a little circular insert and there was a huge flame underneath that was like steering hot. And if you wanted it to be hot, you put it right on the eye. If you wanted it to be medium, you put it like to the upper right. If you wanted it to be on low, you put it in the front. So you couldn't adjust the heat of the flame. It was all pan placement on the actual stove top. And you had to learn how to cook that way. And if you flip the eye off that cast iron center and you put your pan right on the fire, it was like you could cook uh, like oh, that whole burger would cook in like three seconds. That's how hot they would get. I'm not sure I was on the hotline when before pre hotline. Well, no, you know what? When I started was right at the very end of the, so the whole kitchen had been redone. Um, mm-hmm. The only thing that wasn't finished was chef's office at that time. Um, now that I think about it. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we had those old stoves and we also had an oven on that hotline that we nicknamed Satan. Because I that oven that. was so hot and you couldn't control the temperature of it. But if you were behind and you put a French onion soup in that oven, you could literally count to 10. And if you counted past 10, it was burnt. 
That's how hot that oven was. We don't really know how hot exactly temperature wise, but I could put a very thick veal chop in there after searing it, and it would be done in about four minutes or less. That's how Crazy. hot that oven was. Yeah. I do remember that there were two different grates we had on the new line. The first ones were like a more like a wire kind of thing. And then we got those bigger cast iron, like wavy yep. ones. Mm -hmm. And they were like super custom um, to the, to the burners themselves. And I guess once they got moved and then tried to get put back, you know, when we clean, mm -hmm. they just never, they never got put back where they belong yeah. specifically. And then you ended up with, uh, then you'd have that wavy sort of mm -hmm. uneven surface again. That makes it fun. There's always a challenge. Now, how long do you cook your burgers on each side when they're like I'm that? I'm really just looking for a sear. Okay. So that's probably going to be done within 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. um, and I love that I was, you're toasting the bun, by the way, because that is key. It's just that last little bit of yep. GVD. A little bit of flavor. Um, but I love how simple this is. Right? So, because people think when they're making burgers, you have to like roll them and play with them. And then oh, you have to position them and they take forever. Like that's all nonsense, right? It's just like three simple steps. You can make a really good burger. And, and to Further that, I almost think the more you mess with it, the worse it becomes. Agreed. Um, which is, again, now that I'm like stirring up my sauce a little bit more to try and get it onto my uh, bun a little bit. Um, the key is to let the meat be the star, right? You know, I could easily put, I mean, I, yeah, there's guys that have done, you know, foie gras burgers and everything like that. Um, I actually proposed to my wife with a foie gras burger. Um, I, I would have said yes, too, if I were her. <laughs> she, uh, one of the things she would say all the time is, when I'm 70 and retired, I want to eat foie gras burgers every day. I agree. Um, There's nothing wrong with that at all. When I first got here to Philly, I was working at a steakhouse, um, a high-end steakhouse. And so... I guess it's a thing now that like when you propose you have to get pictures of it. Like it, it's not just like good enough anymore to like propose. You have to you have like documentation. Have yeah. Right. Yeah, you course. can't, it's got to end up I mean, on you Instagram. You can't even make a burger anymore, right? It has to be documented to the internet. <laughs> it's going to be, you know it. <laughs> um, actually I probably can't since my phone is, so, uh, or my camera ask, is my phone. Let me ask you this question. How do you, where do you stand on burger toppings? Like I know this one that you just made is just the meat, the cheese, the sauce, the bun. How do you feel about like lettuce, tomato, onion, pickles, all of those things? Um, I think iceberg lettuce is useless unless it's a wedge salad covered in bacon and blue cheese, which in that case, it's really just a foil to eat bacon and blue cheese, um, which I don't really, I guess, need all that many excuses to eat either of those. Um, tomatoes fine, but, um, I, I feel like most of the tomatoes are trash. Um, you know, I, everyone sees it hit the summer and they automatically think it's tomato season, but really we still have another month or so at least until it's really good tomatoes coming out. Same with corn, you know, it turns June and everyone wants corn right away. And, uh, yeah, it's, a little bit more seasonal than it was prior to, um, to June, but you know, th that's still like a July, August thing. Um, one of the other cooks that used to work at the club, who was also my roommate at one point, uh, for quite a while, actually, um, his uncle owns a farm in Ohio and prior to him bringing back heirloom tomatoes from his farm, I was not a tomato fan but that's just because I had never had a good tomato. And when I finally tried those tomatoes, it was like, oh, this is not only what it could be, but what it should be. Yeah. And everything kind of measures up to that one moment in my mind as far as um, 
tomatoes are concerned. Like if it's not that good, I, I don't want it. Like I'm not mm-hmm. going to put it on my burger just to put it on my burger. Yep. Um, or, I'm or gonna anything say, really. I'm going to say it's okay. You can call out Tom Leonardo. I don't mind. Um, <laughs> chef Tom Leonardo. He's a very good chef. Uh, but um, I remember when he would bring those tomatoes in and they were excellent. He Actually, Tom and I would go back into Gourmet in those days and make tomato sandwiches pretty much every night. Two slices of, re- of really good white bread. We'd toast butter on one side, mayonnaise on the other, some thick slices of tomato, salt and pepper. It's one of the best sandwiches that you're going to eat. It's just it so really good. doesn't get any better. No, when the t- but the tomato has to be good. That's the key. The tomato has to be really fresh and really good and in season. And especially if you have those really good heirloom tomatoes. It's awesome. And, super and that, simple, super delicious. That goes back to the whole whole thing with the burger too. Is like, as long as it's good product, like simply handled, not overcomplicated. Um, you don't need much. Like yep. you shouldn't use it. Like just let it be what it's supposed to be. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I I think again. Burgers are great. Um, I will say one of the things I like with burgers is I like a nice thin slice of onion. I do like onion on my burger, whether that onion. be a Vidalia or a red onion. I'm I, I prefer white Vidalia, like a sweeter white onion. But if you gave me red, I wouldn't complain. Right. But it, uh, again, it, I like I like a thin slice. Not like, like if we were at the club, the shaved red onions would be uh, rinsed, shaved, right. would be really nice on a burger. I don't like to have a mouthful of onion, but I do like a hint of onion and a little bit of crunch while I'm eating my burger. I do like a little bit of crunch from a pickle. Um, that but little I, bit of acid kind of I, really helps. I feel like the pickle could be on the side though, like a spear, like take a bite of it as you eat your burger. That for me is what I like. Right. I, I, totally agree with that um you know especially if you start getting into more of those fancy burgers um you know a a mushroom swiss burger is a good burger but it's a fancy burger Mm -hmm. um you know you don't i wouldn't put a pickle on that just for the sake of putting a pickle on that Mm -hmm. i just heard the sweet potatoes go off so i'm gonna go grab those real quick Yep. And while you're doing that, another thing I like, and I agree with you, I, I would not, I'm not a big iceberg fan, but a little bit of bib lettuce would not bother me on there. Um, even if, depending on what kind of cheese you use, what kind of seasoning you put on the burger, um, a little bit of arugula would be nice, um, mm-hmm. depending on what else you're using. Like if uh, blue cheese and arugula, I like together a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, so that wouldn't bother me. This five is really good too, by the way. Are you gonna? What are you gonna season those with? Um, actually, I use something a little Pittsburgh local. Speaking of pickles, um, there's a place called I believe it's called the Pittsburgh Salt Company. Okay. Let me grab the. Let me grab that on and confirm. Steel City Salt Company, and they nice. make this. Um, Trying to figure out where the camera is tough. I see it right there. Yep. Dill pickle Perfect. salt. Yep. Um, this stuff is really good. Um, so it's essentially salt, uh, dried dill, garlic powder, and then the kicker is ascorbic acid or vitamin C, mm. basically. Mm-hmm. That ascorbic acid adds that um, that like mouth watering vinegar. I love that pickled flavor to it. So, um, I think that's a really good add to these, uh, to to brighten them up a little bit. But my grandfather is the guy that really taught me, got me into cooking when I was a kid, he's from Italy and he would, after he retired, which was the year that I was born, he would cook. That became his hobby. So he and I would cook together. And one of the things he taught me was that when you're making different sauces, different soups, different things, instead of adding a bunch of salt, if you add a splash of vinegar, that does the same thing in a different way and it brightens it up. So I've used that. I mean, they did talk about that in culinary school and, you know, it's the restaurant world, but I always credit that to him because he was the first one that taught me that. And it actually works. A little touch of vinegar, not even so much to taste the vinegar, but just to let it allow the other flavors to pop really works mm-hmm. wonders. I think being the saucier at the club for, I don't know, 
had to have been four years by the time I was moved up to sous chef. 25 years, 30 years. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> it felt like it, um, didn't it? I, that was one of the other th one of the things I learned the most was like how to season, how to bring out flavors. Like, there's not too many other better ways um, to learn all that stuff than to actually like take make a sauce, take it to chef, have him taste it, go back, adjust it. Um, you know, constantly learning. Like, and I'm I'm sure you could still to this day write. A chef menu, um, oh, yeah. just and and know how to produce that, and know what he's going to look for, um, and and what he would say when you taste when he tasted it, how how to enhance it, how to brighten it up, how to whatever, um, you know. It's a but but that the two things that taught me the most at the club was making the amuse bouche every mm -hmm. day when I was in Garmage. Um, because I got to do my own thing uh, within the constraints of making it club the club's food, uh -huh. um, but learning through having ideas and refining it uh, through his experience and expertise. And then um, again, as sous as as the saucier, um, the the different coolies, uh, classic sauces, uh, uh -huh. the glosses, how to bring out the most flavor in the things, the different things that you're making. Um, in, in that respect. So uh, those are the two things that I think taught me the funny? most about flavor. What's what? funny is the depth of knowledge that you have from being in the professional kitchens to the level that you were at and the experiences that I have as well. I still, and I think you're the same way. That's why I'm saying this. I still catch myself when I'm cooking at home or when I'm doing, doing things in the kitchen, going as simple as possible, making it <laughs> simple, easy. And Kind of, quite frankly, avoiding a lot of the rules, like breaking a lot of the rules. Like, and I was watching like during the one of the good things about COVID is going on Instagram and scrolling through and all the different chefs I follow. A lot of them are creating content from their home kitchens because they don't have a lot of else the stuff, other stuff to do. And one of the one guys that I like to watch the most is Jose Andreas. Mm -hmm. And he's one of the best because he's just he's got the personality, he's got the knowledge, and he's in his kitchen cooking things. And he's like saying, I know it looks bad. I'm supposed to be a chef, but it'll, it tastes good. That's all that matters. And he's like not following the rules and just making it the way that he likes it. And that's the kind of stuff that I like. And I see myself gravitating towards. Now, when you're in that setting, when you're in the restaurant, you got to be classical because that's what people come there to get. Right. And, it's, and knowing those techniques, knowing the proper techniques and mastering them, the braising, the poaching, the grilling, sauteing, knowing frying, knowing those you can build on those. But then when you're at home and you're doing it, do you catch yourself just like throwing stuff together and breaking some rules and just making it easy, simple, but still delicious? There are no rules in this kitchen. There you go. Um, yeah. I mean, at, at, at first when I started doing the YouTube, I was pulling out all the ingredients, getting them together. And then I would like put them on my cutting board right down here. And then like I would take a picture from above and then – the more I was doing it, the more I found myself like, oh, why don't I add that to it? Mm -hmm. Like, I should add a little bit of that to that instead. Like, and then I just stopped doing this whole thing because, well, I'm the creator, right? So I don't have to follow anything specific. Yep. If I feel like doing, um, you know, adding a little bit of pickle salt to this sweet potato fry instead of regular salt or you know, maybe, maybe today I wanted to do the, I have a little bit of smoke salt in there. Like, you know, and if, if I was doing sweet potato fries with salmon instead, like maybe I would go for smoke because of that smoke salmon -y thing. Like, yep. I don't know, like there's, to me, it's more about having stuff around and learning um, the, what's sweet, like across the board, you can learn any cuisine if you understand what they use to add sweetness, what they use to add uh, saltiness, what they use to add bitterness, what they use to add umami, like all that stuff, like that's across the board, um, the easiest way to learn cuisine, right? Cause they all use a balance of those flavors. It's just a matter of which ingredient does what or plays what role. Um, and, and when you understand, when you understand that you can, you have a lot more freedom. Um, I'm not saying that you don't need recipes. Recipes are a great start, but um, 
there was there was an ingredient in that. Um, the bread was supposed to have granulated sugar in it um, as the sugar. And like I said earlier, I'm not, I don't usually keep carbs around here, but I happen to have turbinado sugar, uh, sugar in the raw in my cupboard, which I don't, I'm not sure why we even had it here in the first place, to be honest, but I had it. You were so making creme brulee, able... weren't you? <laughs> yeah, my <laughs> wife wishes. Um, but because I had it, like I was able to change it up slightly. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like it's, there's, there's no real constraints on it you can do when, when you understand the techniques and the whys then it, it all opens up as far as um what you can do um what what type of food do you like to cook the most one pot yeah or as little pot as as possible the the cast iron is one of my favorites um again pretty easy cleanup um don't use soap. Just I have a chain mail, chain mesh kind of scrubby that I use, mm -hmm. just to make sure I get all the stuff off the bottom, some hot water, and then wipe it out so it dries, and you know, reseason as necessary. Which, if you're washing your pans correctly, you don't need to do very often. Mm -hmm. um, I, I like to just throw things together in a pot and kind of, you know, maybe I'm searing one thing. And then I have a pot with, you know, the rest of the stuff together, like a stew or like a, you know, a saute kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, as little, as little dishes as possible at home. Um, you know, I think people like you and I have the ability to create things that most people look at. And like you were alluding to, like in the restaurant world, um, they want to be wowed, right? With, with new ingredients, new techniques, whatever. Um, but at the end of the day, like just because I can, just because I have the skill and knowledge to be able to use uh, Activa or meat glue, transglutaminase to, to wrap a piece of chicken skin around a piece of fish doesn't necessarily mean I should be doing that. Like it might look good on a plate, but, the older I get, the more I think mature my food is, the more I want it to be something that my grandma would recognize um, yeah. and understand um, and enjoy. Um, not that she won't enjoy whatever I put in front of her just because, you know, it's grandma. But um, it's I, simplicity reigns, to your be grandma, honest. Your grandma doesn't like fruit caviar? <laughs> I have to text her, but I'm pretty sure she's never heard of it. Uh, I remember that was like the big thing at one point when we first started playing with the the all the different types of um, all that chemistry stuff. It was uh, the fruit caviars and all of you know the transglutaminates and the fish glue and all of those different things. And it's cool. It's cool to play with and see what comes out. But I agree with you 110. percent I like the classics. The classic stuff. They like to me. Very little things are more satisfying than a great burger simply made like you just did today or like a properly roasted chicken with vegetables mm -hmm. and mashed potatoes. Like you give me a really good roasted chicken with vegetables and mashed potatoes. I'm a happy camper. Right. Like, talk, like comfort food is what I, I just I dig. The other thing I like a lot when you talk about comfort food, and this goes against everything that I talk about, but Kraft Mac and Cheese. You can't beat it. It's like the most comfortable comfort food that you're ever gonna get. It's not good. I mean, it's not it doesn't even taste like mac and cheese, but you know what? A, it takes you back. I and and I was actually sort of fighting in my own mind, like, should I use cheddar or should I use American cheese on this burger? Because like to be honest, it's American cheese, like you kind of expect it, right? It wouldn't have been out of place yep. um, to use American cheese on this. Um, so, yeah, for sure. It's no. stuff that... Well, that's that's one of the things I respect about Dave Chang. If you ever mm -hmm. watch like Ugly Delicious and his Instagram, and, like, so a lot of the things... A lot of the things I'll disagree with, but a lot of the things I do like his style with, like he doesn't care where the food cut. Like he straight up said he likes Domino's pizza. 
Mm-hmm. Like, like I, you know, I don't think Domino's pizza is terrible, but I don't think it's the best pizza I've ever had either. But that's his opinion. And, you know, uh, same thing with like Kraft Mac and cheese. I like it. I ate it as a kid and it just, it brings back memories. And I think it's just a good company. Like if I'm with my family and the, the, all the kids are there and they make them Mac and cheese, you better believe I'm having at least one spoonful just because it's that old school comfort food. And it's just, it's, at some level, it's delicious. So, I mean, I mean pizza is the perfect example though. Like, Everybody is trying to do these flatbreads or these like, you know, when you order a pizza and it's like this big, but it's like $27 and you're like, you get it. And you're like, what is this? Like push the rest of it. Yeah. (laughs) When I want pizza, I want like, I I hate to use the word bad pizza, but I want like greasy, floppy, cheesy pizza. Like I don't, it's not, it's one of those other things that I really just don't think should be messed with and tried to be refined. I don't think burgers need to be refined. Uh, but I also don't think that McDonald's is like the low mark. You know what I mean? Like that I goes agree. below. Like, um, I mean, I don't go to McDonald's to eat there. Like I've never gone, Hmm, I'm going to go to McDonald's today. But if I'm on like a road trip and there's nothing else around and I haven't eaten all day long and it's like five o'clock and all that's, there's a McDonald's, I'll eat it. And I don't, hate it but i would also rather probably i would probably get something else if it was available right now if you give me the choice between like mcdonald's and subway i'm probably gonna have a burger from mcdonald's just because i like burgers better than i like like a like a sandwich like that Mm -hmm. i mean that's just my preference from one food over the other but it has very little to do with mcdonald's versus subway so to speak right but yeah I think that, you know, a lot of people, and you probably get it all the time too, but I get it all the time where people are like, oh, I'm sure you're like hard to cook for. Or where are we going to go out to eat? Because and I'm like, I'm very easy to please when it comes to food for the most part. Like there are certain things that I absolutely love and there's experiences that I go to that like will blow my mind. But um, like I, I had a big tasting meal a few years back at Morimoto's, which was phenomenal. Here um, in I, no, in it, was in, it was in Napa. Okay. And it was, it was really, really good. And, um, I had a, you know, my, our buddy, you remember Mike graffiti, he made me, mm-hmm. uh, he, I went, was in San Francisco, went to his restaurant and he did a 12 course meal with uh, different wines. It was one of the best meals I've ever had, like hands down the different smokes, different, you know, different types of foods, different courses. I think he gave me like four foie gras courses, by the way, in that meal, which was awesome. So, I mean, things like that, I love. But, you know, you got to eat multiple times a day. Not every meal is going to be like that. Right. So I don't have the standards of I don't really judge when it comes to food unless it's something super terrible. I mean, I don't eat breakfast very often, but when, you know, I'm finding now, um, having been unemployed for a while, my lunches are usually either a salad or like a wrap of like lunch meat of some form, like not every meal has to be high end. Like I'm easy to please. I don't Mm -hmm. want a lot of frills and fuss. And, and I prefer when other people choose where to go out to eat because decision fatigue, Yep. you know, me too. I don't want to make another decision. I don't care. I'll eat whatever. I'll find (laughs) something no matter where I am. Yep. You know, one of the things we used to eat at the club when we needed a snack was we used to go back and make triple decker peanut butter and jellies. I don't and, think I ever did that one. Uh-huh, we used to do that a lot. And it's like, we're making all this good, all this like high end food. And it's like, sometimes you just want a PB and J and it's delicious at the moment. When, if you, if you're hungry for it and you make it, it's delicious. That's pretty much the rule of thumb. But, um, Brendan, thank you for making the burger, for being here, for chatting. I'm going to ask you really quickly before we go, do you, if you want to mention your website, your YouTube channel, where people can find you, go ahead and throw that out there. Yeah. So I do have a website. Um, it started as a blog. I have a few articles on there. I don't really keep it up to date too much, to be honest. Um, I found that I like the video, uh, outlet better, uh, but that's ironchef.com. Um, and then my, my, my YouTube is also ironchef. Um, and then my Instagram is also I run chef, but it's I run underscore chef. Um, so that's, that's where you can find me. That's what I'm working on. Um, that's kind of the best way to get a hold of me. 
maybe if you guys um, yell at me enough, maybe I'll try and blog a little bit more and get on that website. I said I was going to do that after getting fired, um, you know, because of COVID. And I think I've done one article since. So yeah, but how uh, many videos have you done? 29. Yeah. So, so videos take a lot of time and effort. So that's quite the accomplishment. But they're a lot more fun, I think. Yeah. Um, but this yeah, is man. interesting, not having the ability to edit and <laughs> cut things out. Yep. Um, I never under, I never realized how many times I said, um, until I started editing myself. Oh, and, yeah. and now it's like this, like flashing light every mm -hmm. time, every time I hear it and like I'm editing something. Oh, man. Gotta be in the moment but, for sure. But thanks again. Enjoy that burger. I need, I will, to, go, I need sure. to make a burger now, but, um, yeah, I, I want to remind everyone cooking a conversation. We have more coming your way. Make sure you follow on Facebook, YouTube tw and Twitter, whichever, what, whichever platform you like best. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast because the conversation guy podcast go there every Wednesdays of cooking a conversation plus content all through the week, six days a week, Monday through Saturday. So make sure you subscribe and rate and review. If you like what you hear, we sincerely appreciate it. Have a great evening, everyone. And we will talk to you on the very next episode of Cooking and Conversation. Thanks, Mom. I appreciate it.